All right, so, yeah, we have officially, I don't know if you want to say finally, but we have officially ended the book of 1 Samuel and our study on David, and I believe it was about 20-some weeks that we were looking at David in the book of Samuel, and him being a man after God's heart, and there was amazing good things that we took from that. And one of the takeaways that I saw as I was, we were wrapping up was that David was a man of prayer. Uh, throughout his life, he's in this constant state, communication with God. And that's really what prayer is. And so we see even in the book of Psalms, so many of the Psalms as songs or as worship guides, so many of them are prayers directly entreating, not just talking about God, but talking to God. And so um, these praises, he confesses, he asks God to work. Um, David really kind of showed a life of communication with God. And so as I was thinking, what's a good place to go from there? I thought prayer would be a great thing. Prayer's a tough one sometimes. Um, but really my goal for us is this. this we're going to do it for maybe the whole summer, maybe as long as we can. You can't really exhaust it. <laughs> Um, but my goal for this time is to become people of prayer, to be people, to really grow in our practice of it, um, to appreciate the gift that we have in it, um, and look at passages that talk about prayer. So this summer, that's my goal. I've, I've gotten a few of them that I'm like, oh, that's a really great passage about prayer. Uh, this week's sermon was the hardest one, I think, to get started because it was just like this, I turned on the you know, the, the, the fire hose and just got drenched, it got poured about prayer. Like, oh my goodness, how do I even summarize where we're even going to go? Um, so just so you know, we're going to do a little bit of a, a survey this morning. We're not going to cover the 500 or so times that prayer specifically is mentioned, every verse. But there will be a lot of verses, and I would encourage you to go back to these verses. Uh, just take a note of the reference, maybe, and look them up later to encourage you to pray. Um, but that's really the goal, to be praying more. As a church, I can't think of many things that are better for us to be doing than praying. Uh, growing individually in prayer and as a group in prayer. Um, it's really one of the most basic parts of being a Christian. And since I've got kids who are fresh from Sunday school here, you can think of that classic Sunday school song. Maybe you guys can help me, right? How does it go? It's about, I think you start when you're like a little seed. I think it's a, it's, but it says, read your Bible. What is it? Pray every day. Pray every day. Pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll, it's a great one because it's got like motions to it. You kind of act like a plant and you grow, 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 right? This idea, not just as a plant, but you'll grow in your faith. You'll grow as a Christian. You'll grow in your obedience, all this growth, right? It's, it's a pretty basic tune, uh, but it's profound in its simplicity because really it's the, f not the formula. I don't ever say that the Christian life would be formulaic, but it's this amazing help to communicate and to grow in relationship with God. Read our Bible, pray, right? That's how you communicate. That's how we do it. Um, we need to speak to him, that's the prayer part, our side, and hear from him, that's the read the Bible part, right? hear from his word. And so I thought to myself, all right, read our Bible, pray every day, and we'll grow. That's, that's an excellent sermon idea. Um, and yet, here's the thing, we often struggle to pray. Uh, I'll admit this as a confession to the group, I'm easily distracted, I'm easily discouraged in prayer. I often feel like I'm not getting the answers quickly enough or that I want, and so I neglect prayer, you know. And so what does that song say about if you neglect your Bible, forget to pray, I think it says? I think it should say neglect to pray, really. You don't always just forget. You willfully don't do it, right? What happens then? Do you do the reverse in your Sunday school classes? Okay. The reverse is that you start here and then you shrink, 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 right? And then you... You shrink, and the, I don't know if shrinking physically, right? But it's you lose the relationship with God. You're not growing in your faith. You're not growing in that communion. And so, look, the challenge for this summer, the challenge for today, is to be people who pray. Um, so we could just talk about it, 
but really I think the main thing we want to look at, there's a, hundreds of verses I can't cover in one day, but I want us to be challenged. I think the more we look at it, the more we're challenged, the more we talk about praying, the more we'll encourage one another to pray. And that's the goal. That's what I really want us to do. So we need to make it a priority in our lives. Um, to make it a priority, it's, we need to recognize that it is a great privilege. And so that privilege, I'm going to look at three things, just three basic pieces of it, of that privilege to pray. Okay? Prayer is encouraged through Scripture, and that's what I want to start with. The first thing that we, again, this is the summary, but then I'm going to go with a quick three points about prayer to just encourage us and recognize this privilege we have to talk to God, to share our hearts, to communicate and communion with Him. The first thing is really that prayer is encouraged. There's three E's, if you want to look them up and you want to put them in the outline. Three E's about prayer. And really the first one is prayer is encouraged throughout Scripture. Throughout the Bible, we are told, pray. And we're told it, this message, to do this, we're told it a lot. Many commands encourages to pray. <clears throat> so James 5, 13 is one of them. And it's a great one. It's, it's really in any time it says this. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Praise is also a prayer, right? It's a praise, is a prayer of God, you're great. So if you're happy and you're sad, you're suffering, or whatever's happening, we are told, go ahead and pray. That is a good response to that situation. Um, Philippians 4, 6 is another one. Philippians 4, 6 says this. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Okay, so that's Philippians 4, 6, being told to pray. And it says, look, in every situation, bring prayer and petition, right? What's petition? Requested prayer. With thanksgiving, give those requests to God. So when there's situations that cause anxiety, we're told to pray. So what are those things? In trying times of suffering, in cheerful times, in anxious times, any of those we're told to pray. Uh, Colossians 4.2 is another one that's just another one of these do this passages. Colossians 4.2 says this, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. I know I'm flying through verses, and I'm going to do that today. I won't do it so much in the next future. But again, Colossians 4.2 is this request. It's a request, a, almost an encouragement, a command almost, to pray. And in what situation is that one? When we're trying to help others, right? Pray for us that God may open a door. You want to help others? You want to encourage someone? Telling them a good word is one thing. But if, as these missionaries, right, as they were going out, what is the thing they wanted more than anything? They said, please pray for us. Pray that we may proclaim God's gospel clearly. So if you want to help someone, the best thing you can probably do is pray for them. It might feel like, no, that's, there's so many other things. There's so many tangible things. And yet praying for someone is probably one of the main things. That's what we're told through God's word. Okay. <clears throat> I was thinking about this. We're encouraged to pray in Scripture, and we almost take it for granted. right? It's such an, a big thing. Pray. Just do it. Um, and yet, I was, as I was thinking about this encouragement to pray, it's built on a really basic yet amazing fact. I think we overlook it, and when we overlook it, we don't see why it's so important. Okay, We're told to pray. This is built on the fact that God hears our prayer and is listening. You sometimes almost oversee that, not overlook it, but just kind of take it for granted. Like, well, I'm not going to pray. What's the point of that? Well, look, God, it's built into this that God is hears 
He's listening, and he wants to hear from us. That is an incredible fact of the matter. Most of the time, the reason we don't pray is because, right, God feels far off. It feels like he's not listening. But that's not the fact of the matter. That's our feelings. We're encouraged to pray because God is a living, listening, hearing God. Um, And it's an amazing thing that is really the basis of why we're told to pray. And just as a passage that, that reinforces that, Psalm 34, 3 through 5, as he's talking about praying, he says, Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And he says this, I, I sought the Lord and he answered me. Right? When we're out praying and we're seeking the Lord, sometimes it feels like, well, I don't know. But look, he answers. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. Okay, so Psalm 34, 3 through 5, is just another one that says, look, you seek the Lord in prayer. He's listening. He answers. That is fantastic news. This is not just an exercise of discipline for our own good. Or This is talking to the Almighty God. And so, again, we're encouraged throughout Scripture. It's just about any situation, happy, sad, anxious, good things, when you want to help someone, that's an appropriate thing that we're encouraged to do. So first, privilege to pray is encouraged. But I do want to give you kind of, you might say, okay, good, let's get going, let's pray. Um, I will tell you my second point, my second E that I was thinking about is that prayer is an effort. Prayer does require effort. It's a challenge. It's often described as a struggle. Okay? And so you might be saying, oh yeah, I can relate to that part of this. When you're talking about prayer, you say, yep, I'm encouraged to prayer, yes, but I have a hard time with that. Look, we know we should pray. It's difficult. And that can be discouraging. Right? It's like, oh man, this should be natural to me. I should be like, man, I'm ready to pray. And it's, look, I'm encouraged that Scripture tells us prayer (laughs) is an effort. It requires effort. There is a real struggle to pray, even in Scripture, in people that we would look up to. Um, One of the most famous passages talking about the struggle to pray is in Mark 14. And I'll give you a little hint. I'll, I'll test you here. Mark 14, later in the book of Mark, Also in late Matthew, I think it was Matthew 28. Can you think of a situation? So Mark 14, if you want to type, I'll spend just a second there. 14 verse 36. What situation are we in where people are struggling to pray? Pop quiz. Sorry if you don't have it memorized, but if you're flipping over there, this is right after the Last Supper. You know, appropriate that we're going to be celebrating the Last Supper with communion now. But this is right after the Last Supper where Jesus takes his disciples out to pray. He's about to do the greatest thing that any human has done because he's not just a human, he's God himself as well. Right? And Jesus is about to go pay the penalty for sin by dying on the cross. He knows this is coming. He knows it's the night of, of his betrayal, of probably the worst pain and emotional and spiritual um, <clears throat> right, um, trauma that will, he will ever go through for the sake of salvation for others. And what does he do? He goes and ends says, look, wait with me, watch and pray to his disciples. So you would think his disciples, after three years of following him, after all the things they've learned from him, those guys would be like, okay, let's pray. This is a big night. This is big stuff going on, right? What happens in Mark 14, 36? Um, Well, Jesus is praying, and he's praying, again, just to pick it up, 14, 36, he's praying to his father. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, but not what I will, but your will be done, right? He's praying God's will to be done in his suffering. 
Then verse 37 is just wild to me. He says, then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This passage is one of the most, I don't know if it's, it's almost comical, but it's one of the most discouraging and encouraging passages I could think of for the disciples. You think of the disciples and you think, man, oh man, on the, these great who were with Jesus, these great men who followed him, who got to see him in action live, they can't even pray for an hour when Jesus asked them to, right? Like, man, these guys are the worst, <laughs> right? However, it's encouraging to me on the other side to say, look, Jesus acknowledges that. He says, watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. I think it's an understanding thing. He says, I understand the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So even the disciples struggled to pray. Um, <clears throat> that is an encouragement to me. Not to say, oh, well, good, they did bad at it too. I can do bad at it too. <laughs> Right? It's not to encourage me that way, but it's to say, oh, even the disciples needed to put effort in, in order to pray, in order to, to do that. Okay, that's an encouragement to me. Struggle. Put the effort in. Right? So that's one piece. There's another second one that talks about the struggle to pray. There's more than this, I think, but Colossians 4 is another one talking about one of his helpers. They're working, doing ministry. Those who are working on behalf struggled of, of the gospel struggled to pray. So Paul talks about Epaphras, and he says here, Colossians 4.12 talks about him. He says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you. What does it say about Epaphras? He says, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. To pray is a struggle. It is an effort. It requires effort. Some of you might say, man, I, prayer is just like breathing to me. I'm in constant conversation with God. That, that's awesome. That may be, like I can pray, I just think about him all the time, and yet the Bible also acknowledges that, look, it is an effort to pray. It is an effort to focus on the Lord, um, and i got to think about that. Why is that? Why is it such a struggle? Why does it require effort? Well, the answer that I think is here, and it's part of the answer in that spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, that Jesus says, Prayer is a struggle because it's an act of faith. Faith is a struggle. Our natural tendency is the natural, physical world. Right? We, are, we are spiritual beings, and we live in a physical world. Right? Can those two things be together? Yes. But those two worlds, our natural world and the spiritual world, are in constant tension. So our natural, physical world tendencies pull us towards the natural world, pull us towards sinful desires, right? I mean, think about it. You're, you, you might say, look, I'm going to pray. I, I know this is a good thing. I know I want to grow in my relationship with God. I'm going to pray. And so you, you, you get up, you start, start your day, you know, maybe find a quiet spot, and you say, I'm, I'm talking to the Lord. I got a Bible, and I'm going to talk to the Lord. How quickly does, I don't know if this happened to you, your stomach start to rumble, <laughs> And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, man, I'm a little distracted by, I'm hungry. That's a physical need, right? That's not a sinful need to eat, and yet distracted by that. Or you start thinking about your day and think, oh, all the things that need to happen. I got to get moving to this. I got to do that. Here's these, right? Not necessarily. Or thoughts come into our minds, and they are our literal sinful thoughts and desires. And like, oh, man, I want to talk to God, and here's Satan throwing in an idea of just something that I shouldn't even be thinking about? How did that even come into my mind while I'm trying to talk to the Lord? Yeah, that's because we live in a, this is hard work. The world has physical, is a physical world. 
We have temptations because we are still physical beings. And so to live in faith, to be following God in faith, is hard work. And yet, that is where eternal things are. That's where God is. That's where the rewards are. That's where worthwhile things are, is in the spiritual world. Um, 1 Timothy 6, in this, talking about faith. Faith is an effort. It is a struggle. But it says this, because talking about temptations, right? All these things. 1 Timothy 6, 11 says, look, you, man of God, flee from all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life which you were called to when you made good your confession in the presence of many witnesses. So, so I want to bring our attention to that. It, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of that eternal life, right? Eternal life, you've got you to not fight to grab it. God has provided it. But fighting to remain in faith, to be living a faithful life, is effort. It's not natural to our earthly selves, but it's the good fight. It is the right fight to be in. Okay? So I want to be clear that, right, this effort, this, this fighting is not the, to gain faith, right? Having faith to believe God for salvation, that is not a work we need to struggle to gain. That, the gift of, of faith, of believing, of, of the gift of God that he has given us is not, we don't work to get that. We don't gain that with any effort on our own. The effort there is just to trust God, to believe him for what he's done. If anything, to believe it, that, that is it. Faith alone, grace alone is what has provided salvation. Okay, the biggest struggle should be just letting go of your own, your own ideas and place your trust in God because he's done all that work. So, but I do want to encourage us. Look, we need to be praying knowing that it is a struggle that is worthwhile. Um, as we go in, the third thing, the third piece about prayer that I want to make sure that we know, that we understand, right? It is encouraged in Scripture. It's an effort. The third thing I want to make sure we understand, it is entered into. We are able to pray because of what Jesus did, okay? We're encouraged to pray, because, okay, it is only possible to enter prayer, meaningful prayer, prayer, communion, communication with God. We can only enter that through Jesus, because of Jesus, okay? How are we allowed to pray, right? This is the question. Many people around the world pray. Every, there's prayer in every culture, and people who are agnostic pray and think, pray to the universe, and people who don't, right? Right? There's false people praying to false gods. That's not what we're talking about, right? The issue is to pray to the holy God, the one true God. What gives us any right to pray to him and know that he's listening? Really, it's this. Because here's the thing. I, I had to look at this and, and think about it some. There's two passages that speak to prayer. Because it says this. It says, First off, there's James 5.16 that says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Okay? So a prayer of a righteous person is effective. There's also, is it Proverbs 15 or Psalm? Psalm 14. Psalm 14, too, says the Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind. Verse 3 says all have turned away, all have been corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Okay? So there's two verses. James 5 says, The prayer of a righteous person, some verses say, availeth much, effect, is effective. And then the other says, No one on earth is righteous. No one who does good, not even one. So how do those two passages? And then Proverbs 15, if you just want to write this one in. <clears throat> I found it after I made the PowerPoint. It says, again, the Lord is far from the wicked, 
but here's the prayer of the righteous. Okay, so there should be a little bit of a tension as we read these verses. Say, wait a second. Okay, so God hears the righteous, but there's none righteous. No, not one. Okay, um, Lord is far from the wicked. He hears us. He hears the righteous. How do I become righteous? Is this the effort thing? Do I try and do good? If I do really good, then I can pray, and then God will hear and answer my prayer. Is this the formula for prayer, an effective prayer? Just so everyone knows, it's not a formula. We're not talking math here. This is not, prayer is not something we can break down into do this, then do this, and then you'll have success. God is not manipulated that way. <clears throat> so, but there's a tension here. Throughout all of Scripture, we see people are not righteous. Sin is our default programming. We are born in it. We sin on purpose. And we are distanced between God because of it. Right? God made us. He loves us. He's the creator of the universe. And yet we're in the category, as we're born, of the non-righteous. That's where we start. So prayers really don't get, right? We can't get there. And yet, because, right, it says, the wicked, the Lord is far from them. However, the good news, the part that I want to make sure we know of, the, the entered into, why we can enter into prayer, and why I saved it for the last one, God has made a way to approach his throne, to communicate, to be righteous, to be in the category of the righteous person. And it's through Jesus. It's through Jesus. It's through what we celebrate at communion. It's his death, his resurrection. It's the sacrifice for sin that paid the penalty for all of our sins that made us right with him if you put your trust in him. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ephesians 3, uh, uh, 10 through 12 is, is a whole piece. But it's just, verse 12 says it sums it up the best. It says, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Jesus Christ our Lord, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. There's no way as human beings we can reach to God that we could, in our own good works, in our own effort, be like God or be holy as he is holy. And yet, the Bible says, look, in Jesus, our Lord, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom, not just freedom, confidence. We can confidently approach God. <clears throat> Hebrews 10, 22 talks about it as well and says look therefore brothers verse 19 it says brothers and sisters we have confidence to enter the most holy place what what by how by the blood of Jesus okay a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body Jesus body literal body that lived on earth was broken on the cross it was a physical act that accomplished a spiritual through his death, his resurrection, <laughs> paid the penalty, again, for our sins, the dividing line of holiness and an unholy creation, us, God said, I'm going to make you holy. I can make you holy. I can forgive your sin because Jesus took the penalty for it. And so Hebrews 10, and we're going to look at it and just going to read it again at communion. But it says, look, his body, since we have this great high priest, verse 22, he says, let us draw near to God. Let us draw near with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings. Okay? Jesus died to make prayer possible between us and God. We can know that prayer is heard. We can know that Jesus, God, views us as, as righteous. Not because of what we've done, but because of what he's done, because of what he did in paying the penalty for our sin. Um, it's through faith in him only that we can be so assured and so um, come with confidence to him. 
So if you have put your faith in Christ, if you have done that, no, there's no reason to wait. There's no reason to stay away from him, to not pray. Um, through faith in him, we should be approaching and we should be recognizing this privilege that we have, this privilege that we're encouraged to do, right? It is an effort still, recognize the effort, and yet be grateful, be so grateful that Jesus has provided this way that prayer is, can be a privilege, okay? He invites and encourages us. And so the encouragement today, the one that I want to just talk about and just say, let's take advantage of this privilege that we can speak with God knowing that he hears. And that's the, that's the goal. That's the, as we're going to keep talking, we're going to focus on specific ones. But let's be a people of prayer. Let's recognize. And, and really the main and number one way is starting putting your trust in him. And from there, then the, then the fun starts. Okay. So um, we're going to move to communion in a second, but I just want to close this time as we, that this would just, uh, that I can pray for it as well. Um, the men can come forward to uh, Heavenly Father. We just thank you so much for the gift of prayer, for the privilege we have to talk to you, to know that you hear us, that you encourage us. Come and bring your requests. I, I will listen. I will, I will hear. I'll respond. God, we, we recognize that it's an effort. We, we thank you that uh, despite that, that you encourage us still. You give us the strength we need for it. And God, that it's even possible to pray. We thank you so much for Jesus, for his sacrifice that he paid for us on the cross, that we can enter into prayer, that we can enter into communication and communion with you. I just pray that we would, would recognize it, that we'd be a people who turn to you in prayer, whatever situations are going through in our lives. I pray this in your name. Amen.